The trouble between us and an easy history of white and black women in the feminist movement is the culmination of a corpus of excellent scholarship to which Professor Brynus has put her considerable talents over the past few years. She's done what many feminists believe to be the cornerstone of good feminist scholarship. She's put her theories into practice. Her work as an activist in the social movements of the 60s and her continuing participation in the feminist movement has grounded much of her scholarly work. For instance, her first book, The Great Refusal, Community and Organization in the New Left, 1962 to 1968, set the theoretical and empirical foundation of much of her work since then. Later, she edited with Alexander Bloom a series of essays and articles wonderfully entitled, Taken It to the Streets, a 60s Reader. Her next book, Young, White, and Miserable, Growing Up Female in the 50s, another wonderful title, explores her interests in race and gender, looking to the beginnings of a woman's movement through the lens of white women in the 50s. I want to point out that in many ways, Winnie Brynus was in the forefront of helping us to analytically understand whiteness as a racial category. Our usual approach to race is to look at the other from a white and often Western perspective. In this sense, Professor Brynus has turned the tabor, tables on our usual understanding that only blacks or people of color have race, as in another context, only women have gender. Today, Winnie Brynus will explore why a racially integrated women's liberation movement failed to develop in the United States and how white and black women's participation in the movements of the 1960s led to the development of separate feminisms. The Trouble Between Us addresses important issues that are pertinent to race and gender equality and all of those struggles today. So without further ado, let's hear from our own Professor Winnie. Thank you, thank you, thank you, <laughs> Debbie. Um, <laughs> I've got a speechless. <laughs> um, and thank everybody. I, I won't look for the people who sponsored this um, and who invited me, but and thanks to, for all the students and colleagues and friends who are here. Um, I was a political activist in the 1960s, which uh, you probably have uh, surmised from what has been said. I'm a white woman deeply influenced by the civil rights movement, black power politics, including the Black Panther Party, and Marxism, a new leftist who became a feminist in the late 1960s. I realized when I said this and I started going over the sentence, I thought, woo, this is a mouthful of words that only people who probably uh, are familiar with the movements of the 60s even uh, know what I'm referring to when I talk about black power politics, the Black Panther Party, Marxism, New Leftism, and feminism, I think people probably know. But anyway, I, um, they're all 60s references, uh, uh, references to movements of the 1960s, which I suppose is pretty relevant that people don't know about them. Um, and I won't go further to explain them, although I might in the course of the, the talk. Um, having been brought up in the 1950s when white suburban middle class Americans were filled with hope and prospects of prosperity and harmony, I was an optimist. When I realized that most Southern African Americans lived in servitude and poverty, I was disturbed and disillusioned. My disillusionment with America has lasted many decades, and yet surprisingly, like many of my generation, Ideas of universality and justice still move me, as does an interracial society in which people's race is irrelevant to their life chances and relationships. I recount this because as an activist in the socialist feminist movement in Boston, and again, here's another term, socialist feminism, that I'm sure most people are not familiar with, but just very briefly, it's, it, socialist feminism means exactly what it sounds like. It sounds like people who were so, feminists in the uh, late 60s and 70s, maybe still today, and who believed um, in capitalism. I mean, in, who were opposed to <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> I was going to say anti-capitalism, but who believed in socialism. So um, as an activist in that movement, 
Um, I, like most other former white leftists and anti-war activists who became feminists, was committed to creating an interracial feminist movement in the United States. We were unsuccessful. As a sociologist and scholar of the movements of the 1960s, I have pondered this for many years. Why, did not, why didn't an interracial feminist movement develop? One of the central accusations against the early women's liberation movement is that it was racist. Commentators, including whites at the time and since, have consistently described white feminists' emphasis on gender at the expense of race and class as naive, hurtful, and obtuse about what it means to be a woman of color in the United States. The accepted explanation of why the feminist movement was primarily white was that it was composed of women who were ignorant about racism and the problems that women of color faced. Because of their white middle class privilege, the account goes, most early feminists, even those who were radical, socialist, and dissenters from the status quo, created a feminism which black women, and black and white women are the primary focus here and of this work, were unwelcome and uncomfortable. As a result, feminism remained predominantly white for many years. I had been a socialist feminist, and I knew that we were not racist. Nevertheless, the conventional history of feminism is that the movement was. I should add that this is a subject which continues to create strong feelings among former activists. It is a controversial area of research and discussion. After a considerable period of time, I realized that my research questions were shaped by what I refer to as white nostalgia. Whites like myself, of approximately my generation, are sentimental about racial integration. They still see a harmonious, colorblind society as desirable and assume that if it would come about if they were consciously anti-racist. Race would be irrelevant. Integration would prevail. Young middle-class whites had grown up with the image of the family of man. The title of a well-known 1950s Museum of Modern Art photographic exhibit curated by the photographer Edward Steichen that became a book found on many coffee tables in middle-class homes which underscored the multiplicity of humankind across the globe. Many young white middle class whites believed that if only whites would give up their prejudice, we could all live together harmoniously. Dr. King reinforced this idea, and all of you probably are familiar with the I Have a Dream speech. Um, love between the races, even justice, could be achieved through whites' good intentions. The early youthful civil rights organization, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which I refer to as SNCC from now on, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, um, had as one of its symbols white and black hands intertwined. And um, there's a picture of, of, like, of that in my book. Young white radicals harbored an image of love between the races that they had significantly never experienced, one that was based on an idea rather than the reality of racial domination and racist institutions, most northern whites had little or no contact with African Americans. Segregation pre prevailed in the north as well as the south. Movement whites were often deeply moved by interracial relationships. Inspired to recall his time in the southern civil rights movement by the anthem, We Shall Overcome, which was the anthem of the civil rights movement, activist Pat Waters wrote, and this is a quotation, black and white together, I feel the old, choked, aching joy, and for a second, the old leap of hope boundless hope, we shall overcome. While blacks were not disinterested, they were certainly more interested in equality and justice. Integration was a means towards equality, not necessarily the goal. These realizations led me to recognize that my research questions were informed by disappointment. I was nostalgic for interracial harmony and mourned for what I hoped could have been. I had thought that it would be politically easier than it was, that African American women would simply see that we were all sisters under the skin and join us. But they did not flock to the feminist movement. I realized then that I had to revise my regretful questions and try objectively to understand what had occurred from the perspectives of both white and black uh, female activists. I learned, for example, that as early as the civil rights movement, there were tensions between white and black <coughs> activists women activists. In 1964, when SNCC was facing a crisis about its future, two white female SNCC activists, Mary King and Casey Hayden, oh, um, I was going to say Casey, I thought the, the poster of the book cover was here, but anyway, the white woman on the cover of the book um, is Casey Hayden. So two white female SNCC activists, Mary King and Casey Hayden, 
with some help from other white women, wrote an anonymous paper about sexism in SNCC. It was not well received as they had suspected it would not be. They had not used their names for just this reason. At the end of a long day at the conference where the paper was submitted, one of the leaders of SNCC, Stokely Carmichael, said in jest, and this is a quotation from Stokely Car Carmichael, the position of women in SNCC is prone. Uh, repeated and interpreted numerous times, this sentence became iconic. In particular, one of the strands of the radical white women's liberation movement can, in part, be traced back to this moment when white women articulated a critique of the situation of women in SNCC and to Carmichael's response. This and a second statement by King and Hayden influenced white female activists in the New Left and anti-war movements who spearheaded radical and socialist feminism. They had been chafing at male chauvinism in the mixed movements. And when I refer to the mixed movements, I'm referring here to male and female movements, and particularly the New Left, the anti-Vietnam War movement, Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS. So women in those movements were critical of the male chauvinism of those movements. Um, and they took Stokely Carmichael's statement at face value. They believed that he seriously meant what he said and that it was symptomatic of attitudes of men in the movements. Black female civil rights activists, however, did not worry about the sexism in SNCC to the same extent that white women did. In fact, they were critical of white women for bringing up issues of gender in the midst of a life and death racial struggle. Many stated that they had never experienced the kind of sexism about which white northern middle class female white civil rights volunteers complained, nor had they felt powerless. They had been raised to take care of and stand up for themselves. SNCC activist Joyce Ladner stated, and here's a quotation from her, this is a quotation, we came from a long line of people, of women who were doers, strong black women who had historically never allowed anyone to place any limitations upon them. The Stokely Carmichael statement and debate about the memos exposed and informed differences between white and black women that followed them into subsequent movements. Their disparate perspectives were shaped by race and class. Many more white women than black women in the civil rights movement were focused on gender issues. Discontent with expectations that they would work in offices and in freedom schools. Those were informal schools that were set up in Mississippi to teach young, for educating young black uh, children who had terrible schools. And the white vol women volunteers were expected, who went south, the white northern women volunteers, were expected to work in the offices or work in, in, in the schools. And so they were expected not to be out in the field organizing, and they were concerned, upset that men were the official leaders, that SNCC seemed to be less democratic than it had been in, in the past. This is four years after the, uh, the origins of SNCC. Black women were impatient with what they considered middle class white women's issues when black women were risking their lives against dangerous white segregationists in a racial struggle of immense magnitude. They perceived the complaints of sexism as unjustified or inappropriate. Furthermore, some were unhappy with heterosexual interracial romantic relationships that had developed, usually between northern white women and southern black men, particularly during the summer of 1964, which was referred to as Freedom Summer um, in Mississippi, when many white students went south. Ironically, given the interracialism of that summer, gender and sexual tensions divided women racially. By the second half of the 1960s, the black power movement was making its presence felt. Many, mostly northern black women, were deeply influenced by black nationalism and ideas that promoted a proud, militant black identity in which black skin, body, scholarship, and culture were celebrated as beautiful and strong. They recognized that African Americans had roots and an important history, that their contribution to American life was central. Black is beautiful was one of their rallying cries. Black youth believed in black solidarity and in creating their own culture and institutions. Many were militantly anti-white and thrilled at new images of dignity, power, and beauty that, black power mil that the black power movement instilled in them. They grew afros and were inspired by Malcolm X, Amiri Baraka, the Black Panther Party, and the militant Angela Davis. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, it was unlikely that young radical black women would join radical white feminist organizations or easily define themselves as feminists. Their trajectories were different from whites in part because they were members of an oppressed racial minority. 
They too faced sexism in their movements and organizations, but their inclination was not toward separation from black men. Many black power advocates, men and women, argued that the black community was just discovering itself and could not afford gender divisions. The women primarily writers of the cultural wing of black power, called the black arts movement, recognized the masculinism of black arts and black power leaders. They rejected the idea that racism had harmed black men more deeply than it had black women, and that as a result, black men needed to be the leaders and the head of the household while women raised children. In her important book, The Black Woman, Toni Cade wrote that black women were being, and this is a quotation from Toni Cade, uh, black women were being encouraged in the name of the revolution, no less, to cultivate virtues that if listed would sound like the personality traits of slaves. They were particularly aggrieved when male black power advocates who attacked white society and white people got intimately involved with white women. Young black women were, became proud and strong and were loyal to the black community and to their men despite male chauvinist ideology. At the same time that many had gender critiques of the black organizations and politics that nurtured them. Cade's 1970 book was evidence of feminism and gender divides in the black movement, although the women's perspectives did not lead directly to a black feminist movement. They were often torn between racial solidarity and gender considerations, critical of the politics and behavior of black radical men, but committed to the race and the, to the, race and the struggle for racial freedom. <coughs> By the late 1960s, white fem feminism was taking off, um, was mushrooming. Um, but, and at the same time, many black radical women were angry and hurt by black men and white women, but with no obvious political space of their own. In the later years of the decade, young white radical women, which is what we usually think of when we think, or not of white women, when we think about the feminist movement, many of whom had been involved in the civil rights movement, streamed out of the new left and anti-war, uh, anti-Vietnam War movements, and enthusiastically organized their own movement, feminism. Feminism. Groups of youthful feminists sprang up around the country. One of these was Bread and Roses a white Boston socialist femi feminist organization founded in 1969 that lasted two years and out of which other Boston socialist feminist organizations and institutions grew. Most of the women were middle-aged and college educated. They were critical of the movement's male chauvinism, and I'm referring here mainly to the New Left and the uh, anti-war movement, and eventually formed their own independent groups that comprised the radical wing of the feminist movement. They focused their wrath on movement men and on sexism and capitalist society. As socialists and as anti-racists, they were aware of class exploitation and racism and had as their goal a radical integrated women's movement that would be fundamental to building a just, peaceful, and racially integrated society. Their statements and position papers, like those of all socialist feminists, referred often to class and race and the necessity of reaching women who were not privileged and white. Socialist feminists recognize that although their gender put them at a disadvantage, their class and race created privileges. A Bread and Roses leader, Meredith Tack, stated, we cannot, this is a quotation, we cannot talk of sisterhood without realizing that the objective position in society of most of us is different from that of welfare mothers, of the black maids of our white mothers, and of women in third world countries. Sisterhood means not saying their fight is our fight, but making it our fight. Notwithstanding such relatively sophisticated understandings of race and class, white feminists often conceptualized women as an undifferentiated group oppressed by men. Paradoxically, these contradictory themes persisted alongside one another. White women operated politically on a double track. One emphasized gender as the explanation for women's subordination, articulated in the phrase, sisterhood is powerful, with the assumption that all women were sisters, and the other recognized that gender was an, inadequate, was an inadequate explanation for all women's difficulties, that race and class mattered. Often they combined these analyses and at other times veered back and forth between them. Throughout, they persistently worried about their primarily white and middle class constituency. Even amid the thrill of solidarity, they recognized differences in the group, the most immediate of which was sexual preference. Lesbian feminists came out and demanded to be acknowledged and embraced by their straight sisters, whom they accused of homophobia. In many feminist organizations, it was a fear that sexual difference would divide women and further stigmatize 
the movement, and it did both. But confronting their sexual heterogeneity was a major step toward understanding that they could be different and work together, a critical political lesson that took years to learn. White feminists had initially noted that men had more power than women, but they learned quickly that power differences based on sexuality, race, and class existed among women. It turned out that sisterhood was not so simple. Despite their desire and their ideals, early white socialist feminist efforts to build an interracial movement founded on their inevitable abstractness. Bread and Rose's members did embrace anti-racist politics, but those politics were not rooted in the actual lives of black women. Except for those who had been in the civil rights movement, few white women had real experience with black women. They did not know them. Racial segregation impeded their ability to break out of their own race and class positions, un understand that they could be racist themselves, and recognize the particular needs and quandaries facing black women. As a result, their message and the organizing that followed proved, proved confusing, difficult, and ultimately unsuccessful. Here, I want to talk a little bit about black feminism and then try to put it all together. Inspired by the racial solidar solidarity of the black power movement, most radical black women did not join the white socialist feminist women's movement. Furthermore, they were suspicious of white women's gender politics with its focus on abortion, personal life, and sexuality. From their perspective, white women complained about lives that were far easier than those of working class and poor women, particularly women of color. Basic survival issues faced most women of color. They needed their jobs. They needed jobs that paid enough. Sharing housework with men, for example, was not on the top of their list of pressing issues, which seemed to be one of the issues that uh, a white middle class women were, were concerned with. Who did the housework? Um, African American women were alienated by feminist critiques that emphasized women's subordination as mothers in the nuclear family. And this is another pattern of early feminist work where uh, white middle class women uh, were critical of the of motherhood and of oh, I should say of perhaps maybe forced motherhood or the kind of cons the feminine mystique idea that uh, women had no other choices besides being mothers. African American women were alienated by feminist critiques that emphasized women's subordination as mothers in the nuclear family. Their mothers and families had nurtured many of them. As racial minorities, they were often connected to their communities and their men in ways that white women were not and to which whites were insensitive. Furthermore, they often found white women ignorant of race and class and insulting in their analyses and outreach. And I just want to mention here briefly, there were black feminists in the late 1960s and early 1970s. I don't want to imply that there were no black feminists, but it was really the white movement that, or a movement of white women that took off really in the late 60s and early, and most of the 70s. Small groups of black women developed feminist organizations that combined gender, race, and class politics. Some were radical anti-imperialists who opposed the war in Vietnam and identified with third world women revolutionaries. And for those people who have either looked at some of the uh, material from the 1960s or lived through it, one of the sort of famous posters of the 1960s was of uh, a woman, revol a third world woman revolutionary carrying a gun with a baby on her back, um, which women, feminists, uh, uh, well, I can't even begin to explain why white middle class feminists would use this as a model. Oh, well, I guess I could explain it, but anyway, it was far from their own experiences, but, but inspirational. Um, others were not anti-capitalist feminists, but radicals nonetheless, the most well-known of which was the National Black Feminist Organization, founded in 1973 in New York City. The organizers were primarily educated professionals who saw the need, and polls, and this is interesting, polls consistently showed that black women supported feminist goals, even if they weren't in organized groups. Um, for if black feminist, or they saw the need for a black feminist organization and convened a meeting to which about 400 women came. Within the year, there was a membership of 2,010 chapters around the country. The group emphasized economic survival issues important to black and working class women. Some chapters evolved into longer lasting groups, but these and other groups never generated a mass movement. And I want to talk briefly here about the Combahee River Collective, which formed in Boston in 1974. Anybody who knows any 
history of feminism knows that the Combahee River Collective was an extremely important organization. The women came together out of the National Black Feminist Organization, deciding to form their own collective because their politics were more radical, particularly about lesbianism and socialism. The group was small and is best known for its manifesto, a black feminist statement. And anybody who looked, um, you can look at any anthology of uh, feminist writing and you find, a, or not everyone, but a black feminist statement by the Combahee River Collective, which articulated a black lesbian socialist feminist politics and is widely considered one of the most influential documents of black feminism. It stated that they were, and this is a quotation, actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and saw these major systems of oppression as interlocking. Something that uh, they were really very early on in articulating the intersection of race, class, and gender. Um, they noted that they were anti-racist, unlike white women, and anti-sexist, unlike men. They focused on their own oppression, which they referred to, and they actually used the term identity politics, but affirmed their solidarity with black men since the black community required solidarity. They were angry at the sexism of black men, but loyal to their communities in ways that white women were not. The Combi River Collective statement has inspired generations of feminists around the country, white and of, col of color. Um, the idea that black women were undervalued in society and that they had no choice but to stand up for themselves and fight oppression on many fronts struck a deep chord in many radical African American women. And I just want to provide a little context here. In these years, there were bitter discussions among black academics and intellectuals about the black family, relationships between black women and men, a black matriarchy, and sexism in the black community. Black feminists were on the defensive as they worked to construct an autonomous independent movement. The 1965 Moynihan Report, entitled The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, written by Department of Labor official Daniel Moynihan, revived old controversies about strong women and weak men in the black community, men who couldn't or wouldn't support and protect their families, women who took over as a result and were too strong. <coughs> Uh, creating a dysfunctional family. This was, uh, you can still, there's a lot written about this, and this was an extremely influential and important uh, document uh, and created all sorts of responses because there was, uh, it was considered quite demeaning to the black community and didn't use a kind of historical analysis. Um, bitterness framed the discussion, revealing how deeply participants believed not only that the future of the black community was jeopardized but by the estrangement between women and men, but that feminists exac exacerbated the divide. It was in this context that black feminism struggled to develop. So black feminists were really in a, had a, a much harder, which is not surprising, situation because of the debate about the black family and black women being too strong. Um, and feeling a kind of loyalty the, to uh, the black community because of their racial uh, oppression um, and trying to sort of forge a position for themselves. Um, as I said, black women were united by their hard feelings toward white feminism. An enormous literature exists by black women and other women of color about white feminist racism. Black feminist anger is not irrelevant to the story of the development of a separate black feminism <laughs> And of a separate black feminism, and that anger represents the continuity of some radical black women's feelings from the mid-1960s SNCC days into the early 1980s. One important frame of reference for black feminists was inevitably white feminism. Despite their sense that they had little in common with privileged white feminists, they had no choice but to respond to them. White women frequently centered their attention on, on gender issues disconnected from the lives of African American women. Black women were not subordinated solely through their gender, and many were disheartened that white women do not seem to understand the intersection of gender, race, and class in the lives of women of color. In addition, they had numerous personal interactions with white women that had hurt their feelings or angered and frustrated them. Thus, the black power movement's compelling racial identity politics and I don't just, I, I, I think that the black power movement's uh, attraction for young black people was extremely powerful in these years. Um, so if you were making a choice of a movement, you would have been more compelled by, um, by black power as a, a young black woman. You'd be more compelled than by um, feminism. 
so the black movement's compelling, uh, black power movement's compelling racial identity politics as well as its sexism, the low salience of black women's issues in the white women's movement, and racist interactions with white feminists were all factors that convinced black feminists that they needed a movement of their own. By the late 1970s and early 80s, a number of events took place that indicate the enormous learning curve about race that radical feminists had undergone for over a decade. They were able to come together politically on grounds other than an interracial sisterhood of solidarity and love. Instead, difference became the idea that shaped feminism. Difference is the word that describes the central political insight of feminism in the late 1970s and early 80s, in part because feminists had no choice but to confront difference within and between their movements. Black women and women of color struggled over the terms women of color and third world women, whether and how such inclusive terms effaced their differences and what the implications were. Identity politics were exhilarating for previously marginalized groups, but attempting to carve out bases for cooperation and shared perspectives was not. White's nostalgia was replaced by hard-headed political confrontations about how to work for feminist goals, now more widely defined across race. The project of black women and, white, and women of color resulted in white feminists, all feminists really, raised consciousness about the realities of race and class. Um, I just want to mention here, and I won't go into it, um, but, but there, were, uh, there were a couple of events that happened in the 70s. One of them was um, the arrest of Angela Davis, and I don't know how many people uh, know who Angela Davis was. Um, she was uh, a radical African-American uh, activist, and she, for any, she, the, re, the, the way that she was an articulate, she was an academic, she um, was arrested. Uh, for aiding and abetting uh, an escape by George Jackson. I won't go into the whole story because most of you don't know it, but in any case, she became a heroine uh, because she was, un she was falsely arrested, and she was very militant. And I, what, I was gonna say, what I was going to say was that she, um, she became known because she had a huge afro, and so you can, if you actually look back at, at photographs from the 1960s, you can see pictures of her. Um, so she became an icon, actually, and the, 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 the struggle to free Angela Davis was uh, um, an area where black and white women worked together. Um, and then there was one other case, well, there were a number of cases, but there was, I just wanted to mention this one because um, of a picture in the book, my book, of this woman, Joanne Little. And Joanne Little was um, not very well known, but she, be she became a kind of a, a cause in, in, among radicals in the 1970s because she was, um, she killed, she was in jail. She was a young, black, poor woman in North Carolina who was in jail who was raped by her jailer and she killed him. And um, they were gonna, I think she was actually going to be put to death. And there was just a huge, a huge, campaign to free her. And it was also about sexual violence and whatever. Anyway, the, uh, and it brought together white and black women. The reason I just want to mention this is that there is a picture in my book of Joanne Little, Little speaking at Northeastern University after she was acquitted. So, um, and I didn't know that. I mean, I was looking for photographs and I found one of her speaking at Northeastern. Um, I just want to mention one example, a local example of cross-racial learning among feminists, and this was called the Coalition for Women's Safety in Boston. In 1979, 12 poor black women and one white woman had been murdered in black neighborhoods in the city. Black feminists and female community activists mobilized out of fear and rage at the police and media that downplayed the murders. In a widely distributed brochure written by a number of Combahee River Collective members, the situation of poor black women was analyzed. They wrote, and this is a quotation from them, our sisters died because they are women just as surely as they died because they are black, unquote. They provided guidelines for women to protect themselves in the city. White feminists from outside the community positioned themselves as a support group, recognizing that women of color, not they, should be the leaders. And that was one of the criticisms that black women, African-American women, often made of white women, that they always took, uh, took the leadership positions or ended up being the spokespeople in organizations. Um, the leaders of the campaign uh, about the Coalition for Women's Safety 
uh, linked race, gender, and class in their analyses of the murders and the inadequate response of the authorities. The authorities said that most of them were prostitutes and they didn't really spend a lot of time trying to figure out what, what had happened. The issue of violence against women had become an arena in which Boston feminists could forge common ground Having organized battered women's shelters, right, rape crisis centers, and take back the night demonstrations that demanded that the streets be safe for women. They had learned how vulnerable women of color were to violence. They were also learning how to work together in coalitions that respected their differences. Black lesbian poet Audre Lorde, who spoke often in Boston, argued repeatedly that differences could enrich their politics. This quotation from Audre Lorde, as women, we have been taught to ignore our differences or to view them as causes for separation and suspicion rather than as forces for change. Barbara Smith of the Combahee River Collective noted how different the coalition for women's safety was because white women had not centered themselves as leaders, but had instead constituted a support group to help the coalition run by women of color. White women recognized that they had to raise the issue of racism in their own communities and that they would never be able to end violence against women unless they respected and understood the situation of women of color and honored their leadership. So everyone spoke very highly of this experience, which was unusual when you do a history of feminism. <laughs> um, the social movements of the 1960s and 1970s were extraordinary, seemingly from nowhere out of a relatively conservative domestic post-war period in the United States, radical youth movements <laughs> appeared and expanded rapidly. Not incidentally, young activists grew up in a time of plenty or its possibility and all were inspired by the promise of American democracy and prosperity. They could afford to be idealistic. Political rhetoric and the economy cooperated to create the idea, embraced by black and white youth, of the possibility of racial equality and justice for all. They believed that they could democratize the United States. Resources were plentiful. Political opportunities existed. Many became politically aware and activist in their desire to create a society that lived up to its stated ideals of freedom. But by the late 1960s and 70s, the culture and politics of the radical social movements were transformed. Activists could no longer look to those in power to facilitate change. The government's inertia in response to the civil rights movement, its continued escalation of the war in Vietnam, and domestic repression directed the movements educate, directed at the movements. The domestic repression directed at the movements educated them about how power works. By the late 1960s, they faced clear and unyielding state and corporate power, and it was no longer easy to be idealistic and hopeful particularly about peaceful change. Optimism evaporated as frustration and anger grew. The movements were changing. And I say this, I don't really, um, I might, it depends how much time I have, but I think what I've just said about the prosperity, the hope, the idealism, is very important in understanding those movements of the, of the particularly the early 60s and how it changes in the late 60s. And to think about Today, I teach, and some of you were in my class in the 1960s, and even today we had a conversation about why people don't vote and uh, how people feel about politics. And for the most part, my, my observations have been is that people are fairly cynical about politics now, feel pretty disempowered, don't know how they can make change if they want to make change. And um, when you read, and of course it was 40 years ago, which is, Somebody, for me, it's very hard to believe, but um, it was 40 years ago that the movements uh, were active. And I do believe that the, the utopianism or the idealism was pretty, uh, along with all the other possible things that I've referred to about the resources that were available, the prosperity, the low cost of living. As somebody said in my class today, we work so hard, we don't even have time to go to meetings. Now, which ne isn't necessarily an excuse, but I think students' lives are very different now. People's lives are very different now. So it's interesting to think about the, the differences. And as I said, one of the things that was very operative had to do with the influence of the civil rights movement on young people. And the kind of Martin Luther King, nonviolence, kind of hopefulness. Hope is very significant, I think, and expectations that you could change and that the government would actually be responsive. And I think there is a kind of not a, there's no longer a sense of that um, in the polit in political culture and in, in politics today. Um, and as I said, I uh, well I don't know if I said this, but 
as the, the movements change from the early 60s to the late 60s and the kind of cynicism and anger and frustration develops, I think we are still living in a, a period of um, a, a, where that source, where that begins. In other words, I mean, I guess we could have a long discussion about that, but the, the kind of sense that the government was adversarial, was not listening, that you couldn't really count on the government in any way to uh, respond to grassroots movements, I think um, you see today, and you see that has grown over those, over those decades. Um, based on ideas of difference, solidarity between and within movements could no longer be assumed, nor could brotherhood and sisterhood groups were no longer able to take for granted similar worldviews or agreement on, on strategies. Goals became less abstract. White feminists, for example, were forced to deal with the real feelings and politics of African American feminists about racism and unequal resources. Whereas before white women had assumed gender solidarity and that their anti-racism had been transparent, now they had no choice but to search for, base, for bases of mutual interest. Coalitions had to be continuously negotiated. Interracial cooperation was no longer an unexamined movement tenet nor was the ideal of racial integration. And I just want to end by saying the racial story of feminism is more complicated than white women's racism. While it is true that radical white feminists were abstract in their anti-racism and made many mistakes, it is too simple to dismiss them as racists. Legacies of racism weighed heavily on activists and still do. They made it difficult for socialist feminists or radical feminists or any any uh, activist, I think, not to reproduce the history of slavery and of unequal uh, race relations and racial divisions. And that was particularly true, or was certainly true for women. It is a formidable task for a social movement to overcome centuries of slavery, racism, and sexism. Young feminists came face to face with enormous forces that were not only out there, but were, despite their best intentions, inside them. They struggled with these issues and did not give up. They were pioneers in a, ra in a national racial saga in which whites and blacks attempted to work together across the color line for gender justice, a vanguard in the project of creating inclusive multiracial and multi-ethnic movements and institutions. The racial learning curve that began in the early 1960s and lasted for over a decade was sharp and continues today. White and women of color feminists learned that it was possible to be connected in difference albeit in less grandiose and more circumscribed political projects than they had originally envisioned. Unsurprisingly, there is no clear resolution to the story, although it is a significant story nonetheless. White and black feminists experience the loss of each other, as do all Americans who live in segregation, separated from people of other ethnicities and races. They were divided, but doggedly attempted to work politically across race in order to find each other again on different, more complex grounds. Feminists' impassioned project to build a racially diverse movement taught them a great deal. And I think it can teach us a few things, too. Thank you. Oh, uh, that was such a central theme of Val Patrick's uh, campaign. And Barack Obama has a book on that, uh, with that title, oh. Open in the Title. Oh, yeah. And so it's interesting at this particular point, there seems to be you know, a recognition of many of the issues that you raise. And, um, it seems also that you know there's been a backlash against uh, feminism, Susan Faludi's book, for example, and others. And so one of the questions I have, and particularly in this era with the rise of the right and so forth, and the manner in which much of the new left, one could argue, went into the area of identity politics, so how can you bring different movements together after learning these lessons and not only have a movement which respects the politics of difference, but also provides some kind of commonality a basis for solidarity. We respect difference, but we recognize that we're, we share certain uh, sources of oppression that are common to all of us. In particular, what are the lessons that we can learn from the women's movement, where this was really worked out, perhaps in its fullest fashion? That's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe you could provide us the answer, so then we can go out and Begin making the change. Make the social change. Um, I don't think I know the answer to that, but I mean, if anybody wants to, and maybe you know, you have some ideas, Danny, yourself, but I don't know if anybody, because basically, 
what Professor Faber was asking was how do we move forward, I think, in making social movement, is recognizing that we do have these differences um, and that maybe there is some basis for change in politics, but how do we, how do we move forward? And uh, I don't know. Do you want to say something more about that? Well, my only thing would be in the current state of politics in American society, particularly when much of what we consider to be the left is organized around interest group politics into these policy silos, it's been very easy, I think, for the Bush administration, the power structure, to play off different movements against one another. So how do we create a political movement and environment by which different movements can come together, have a respect for each other's issues, but develop a common agenda, and then put forth candidates who are bound to that agenda, candidates who come out of these movements who are bound to a common agenda by developed by movements coming together. We haven't reached that stage, and it seems like the feminist movement's been way ahead in bringing about those types of structures, but I don't know if we're far enough along and what you consider to be, the, what were some of the primary obstacles that have yet to be overcome and so mm -hmm. forth. And the environmental justice movement would be another example, which is different movements coming together and forming a, a fuller politics. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I think the excitement of Professor what happened with the Bob Thatcher. Speak louder, please. I think the excitement of what happened with Bob Thatcher's campaign especially last night with the um, celebration and all, and then how the media captured what's ahead of us, specifically find in this particular lecture a, 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 a woman for the first time, an African-American male for the first time in a state um, election. And so the world will be sitting back to see what Massachusetts will do about this from a, a feminist and a racial perspective. And I think it's, it's something that we all should watch and see what happens. Because the test is here. Well, I would also add that they don't necessarily, I mean, um, we would hope that they would, that he, that Deval Patrick would be a feminist, and that she would be concerned about racial equality, so that who, who they are isn't necessarily only what their politics are. But obviously it's significant. about the women of color and white women, where do you see them at today as opposed to um, years ago, in yeah. the 70s and 60s? Mm -hmm. is, is a balance of do they get along better now or is that risk still there? <laughs> that's, a big t that's a big question too. I think that, um, I, I think that a, a lot of feminist organizations are much more balanced in terms of their racial makeup. In other words, that you find women of color and white women working together in all sorts of institutions, uh, social service organizations, and major <laughs> national organizations, so that, so that I think over these decades, there has been progress in terms of people having you know, we are living in a more multi-racial, multi-ethnic society and people having more experience with each other. But, you know, racism is enormously powerful now and I think, um, I mean, you'd have to look at feminist organizations and kind of do an analysis of what what's going on in them. I mean, as I said at the end of my paper, I think, this, and, and in the beginning as well, this is a very loaded topic because I think it is a loaded topic, sort of relations between white women and women of color. Even, you know, whether we're looking at it politically, uh, in terms of social movements, or even personally, there's a lot of baggage there and a lot of difficulty. But I'm also encouraged about it. And I think that's part of what I was arguing, was that people had no experience of each other. And they really had to go through a lot of pain um, and struggle to sort of listen to each other and hear each other. To, see, to recognize that there was difference, but they also had similar goals. But you know, you read the, I don't know what my problem is with this. Um, I, used, I guess I'm using my hands here. Um, you read the material from the women's movement, you read a lot of documents, which I did, some of which are in the archives here at Northeastern, and um, it's amazing how, how, about the hard feelings that people had and how hard they worked 
when you look at the documents, probably from many social movements, but I mean, people writing, 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 position papers, analyzing themselves, trying to understand, figure out how to work better, understand about racism. Um, so they, they worked very hard. And I think they made some progress. Janet. Um, just on this topic, I think it's very interesting that now there are things available to people that were not available then. For example, anecdotally, my daughter goes to a school. It has an anti-racist mission. They offer workshops for people to take called Examining Our Own Racism. Now, in the era that you're writing about, the, those kinds of workshops were not available. And mm -hmm. I took one. And, you know, we learn. And, and then there are these feminist workshops, you know, that Peggy McIntosh used to give. These are sort of based on those. She's a Wellesley uh, College. Uh, professor, and um, I think that you know, in line with what you were saying, there's there are much there are many more resources for pe for feminists, for for everybody to kind of move forward on the racist, the anti-racist agenda, and at the same time continue with their their other political right. um, issues. Yeah, I agree. I think that's true. Anyone else? And it's more so based on the experience. I'm just speaking from being a black woman and interacting with white females. And I find that um, at times it's easier to interact with white males than it is with white females. Reason being that I find that um, oftentimes the, the competitive edge that I feel that goes on uh, unspoken between women. And at times, I also feel that um, certain things that are important that you mentioned in the risk of white women and black women and things <coughs> that are more important to white women or they feel that it's unjust, I don't really pay much attention to that because like for instance, um, I had a very good friend, and she's white, and um, she's complaining about her her day and her struggle, and she just can't believe it. And I said, you know, and in my head, I was just like, do you understand that I work two jobs, <laughs> and perhaps my family background looks a little bit different from your family background, so it's very hard to, to be empathetic. Actually, I do feel that you're in this very good situation, and so um, it's hard to sometimes be late on that level, and when at times um, to say that race is not an issue, I come from a very unique perspective, because I'm also a woman with a disability, so race gender and disability um, also plays a very strong role in my day-to-day -day interaction. And so um, it's very different. The world do treat us very different. And race will sometimes supersede and class will sometimes supersede some of the common issues that we may have women. Thank you. I think that, that was very helpful and I think you're probably articulating a position or a perspective that uh, women from the past um, were articulating about white women uh, who were complaining about things that they felt uh, they didn't really have anything to complain about. So I think we're sort of uh, articulated the problem right here. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're actually, um, we want to make sure we have some time for, um, for Professor Brynas to sign books. So thank you everybody for coming. It was great.